Hi everybody, I'm Mike Muller with the NE Digital team and we have a very special guest sitting with us today. Uh, that is Gail Hauk, uh, Senior Advisor with the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. Gail, welcome. Hi, nice to be here. So you have a very interesting background uh, prior to coming over to DOE, especially with your extensive experience in actually building nuclear power plants, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But first, can you just uh, kind of give us a little bit of insight into who you are and kind of how you got into to nuclear energy? Sure. I started out my education as an electrical engineer, actually. I've always been very interested in power and energy and electricity, but I got a little bit disillusioned with imaginary numbers, which there are a lot of in electrical engineering, and decided that nuclear engineering seemed more fun. And I'm so glad that I did, because the more that I learned about nuclear energy, the more important I realized it was for for us, for the environment, for um, addressing climate change, which wasn't even really something we were talking about yet when I was in school, but I knew it was a better choice for the environment than fossil fuels, and that was something that I really wanted to help um, make sure it made its way out into the world. After my undergrad, I worked at an operating uh, nuclear power plant in New York called Indian Point uh, for about four years as a reactor engineer, which was a, a really great job getting to see all the different things that happen at an operating plant, working refueling outages, getting to see the, the shrink off blue glow for the very first time, which is, uh, by the way, my favorite color. And uh, after I worked at the operating plant, I worked for a nuclear services and fuel company called Westinghouse for about 15 years. When I worked at Westinghouse, I had the opportunity to travel all over the world uh, to our different production facilities, uh, looking at all the different parts of nuclear fuel being built. Um, and uh, eventually I ended up on a couple of international assignments, the first in Japan doing safety analysis, and then the second one, uh, which was a little bit longer at uh, the Baraka nuclear power plant in the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East. I was there for about three years from 2018 through 2021 um, and I had the great privilege of seeing unit, uh, unit 1 start up and unit 2 go through uh, most of its uh, pre-startup pre testing, the cold hydro and hot functional testing. Um, I also supported uh, Unit 3 and Unit 4 getting ready, loading in the, the major plant equipment, um, getting the reactor coolant pumps up and ready to go, inspected, torn apart, put back together. And, uh, and then I came back to the U.S. and uh, went to go do research at the National Labs at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and now I'm here at the uh, Office of Nuclear Energy. So what you're saying is you really haven't done that much yet in the in the nuclear energy space, huh? No, just a, just a couple things here and there. Just a couple things, like building a few nuclear power plants. Can we just go back to Baraka for a second and just okay. talk about your experience there, and not only just from being there from an international perspective, but helping to play a role in building three, four reactors. I think Unit 3 just recently um, has come online. It's exciting to see new nuclear energy coming online, whether it's the Vogel plant here in the U.S. or Baraka coming online in the UAE internationally. It's it's really important worldwide to see that, that nuclear energy and the clean energy production growing. Um, it's, it's very rewarding having, having been there and, and been a part of it and helped to, to make that happen. Uh, and I, I really just congratulate all the, the folks that worked on that project. There's a lot, of, a lot of folks like me that were expats that came into the UAE because we wanted to support the project. We believed in, in nuclear energy, and we wanted to see it be successful. So there was a lot of other folks that kind of came in and, and lended their, their time and their talent to, to that project in the UAE. What was it like working on the Baraka project? Baraka is located about, mm, it's a three-hour drive 
from the closest major city is Abu Dhabi, which is the capital of the U- the United Arab Emirates. There's a big stretch of desert in Abu Dhabi and that stretches into Saudi that's called the Empty Quarter, and it's just lots and lots and lots of sand. Baraka is very close to the Empty Quarter, uh, starting in, in Liwa, where it's just mountains and mountains of sand. So it's, it's right on the on the Gulf. It's on the water, but it's far from from everything else. It's very hot. It's very humid as well. People think that the desert is dry. It is not a dry desert there because it's so close to to the Gulf. I would live at the site during the week. On site, there is no alcohol. There's no pork products because it's a Muslim country. Um, I lived in the ladies' dorm and went to the ladies' gym at the site. Uh, we did have a, a mixed cafeteria on site. Um, so all of meals, all of my meals would be with coworkers. I would see my coworkers at work, and then I would see coworkers at the gym, and then I would go back to the dorm. Um, so it was very intense in terms of just being sur- constantly surrounded by your work and your coworkers. Um, and then on the weekends, I would be able to go back to the, the city of Abu Dhabi and see my family on the weekends. And the nice thing about living in that part of the world is it's so close to so many other things. I had opportunities to travel elsewhere in the Middle East to Jordan, Um, to Asia, to Africa, and to Europe as well while I was there. What's it like working on a a big project like that? Nuclear power plants, historically, you know, one of the the drawbacks that some people will say is um, we can't build them in time. What's it like actually being on the ground and, you know, seeing some of these things come come online? Having worked at an operating plant and working refueling outages, it was often... 12, 14, 16 hour days, six days a week, um, doing night shift, day shift, 24 hours, um, people coming and going. And working at the construction site, it wasn't quite that intense because it happens not over six or eight weeks, but over, you know, almost a decade uh, that that plant was, was in progress of being built. Um, but between you know groundbreaking for unit one and when when it finally um, uh, went critical but it's it's still very intense it's everyone wants to see the plants come online on time um, if things are delayed that's where we we have the biggest trouble with with budget overruns is because of of delays and just the the time it takes to to get those plants up and running. So there was a a very strong uh, collective motivation to to make sure that everything was going according to schedule, that all of the equipment was running properly and ready to go for, for cold hydro and hot functional testing, and that when it was time to, to load the fuel and to start at the plants, that everything would be working the way that it was supposed to be. Can you talk a little bit about the project and in terms of the international collaboration? I mean, it wasn't just like you with a hammer down there, right? I didn't have a hammer. I just used a wrench. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so I think the the Baraka projects are maybe the most unique nuclear projects that we've ever seen in the world and, and maybe will ever see. It, it was such an, an international collaboration. So the, the, main, the main parties involved in the project are the, the Emirati company, ENIC, um, the Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation, and then they had a partnership with um, the Korean nuclear uh, energy companies. But then there was some contractors from, from everywhere. So as a part of Westinghouse, I was there as the, the deputy site manager, and Westinghouse's scope there was supporting the Koreans with some major equipment, such as the reactor coolant pumps and the, the vessel internals, and uh, the all of the instrumentation and control systems, we call it the man-machine 
um, interface interface system MMIS. And so that was that was our part of the work there. But there were folks from all over the world, uh, any country that has a nuclear program, U.S., Canada, uh, Russia, um, Ukraine, uh, South Africa. There were folks from those countries there working at that project, uh, either as employees of the Emirates companies or of the Korean companies or of some contractors. So you met people from all over the world, and the thing that we all had in common was that we all supported nuclear energy and we supported that project. Can you talk a little bit more about diversity in, in the workforce? My understanding when we were talking about this earlier was there were a lot of heavy involvement with a lot of influential women in this project as well. Yes, I was constantly impressed by the the highly educated, highly motivated, enthusiastic young women that were working on this project. A lot of University graduates um, would come and and work at the project. When I was there, it was between 20 and 30 percent women supporting the project. And a lot of them were in engineering. A lot of them were in operations, uh, you know, not just in supporting supporting staff. So it was it was really it was really a, a treat to to have the opportunity to meet these young Emirati women that were participating in in this work in this project uh, because it was something that was of national importance to them. What are some of the things that we can move forward with uh, to build these uh, projects a little bit more closer to the timelines that are initially laid out for them? I mentioned earlier one of the the big important parts was having a team of people that really embrace and and buy into the timelines and believe that the timelines are possible. So everybody was really working towards towards those goals, getting things done on schedule and in the right way. I think one of the other major lessons learned from Baraka that we haven't necessarily seen as much here in the U.S. industry is to not be afraid to bring in the expertise that you need, regardless of where it's coming from. So at at Baraka, when there was a a challenge or an issue, the the Emirati company was, was not afraid to bring in resources from the U.S. or from Canada or from other countries that they needed to solve the challenges that they were experiencing. So that, I think, is an important lesson learned that that we can keep in mind when we're working on our project is to say, just because we didn't invent it here doesn't mean that it's not a good way to do things. You know, let's, let's look at how things were done in other places and why they were successful. And let's bring in those lessons learned and that expertise from from our, our partners and our friends uh, in other places to make sure that our projects can be successful. How important is it to build new nuclear power plants? Personally, I think it is absolutely essential that we are getting new nuclear plants on the grid and making energy and electricity. Fossil fuels kill 8 to 10 million people every year just from pollution and climate change is expected to kill 80 million people in the next 80 years and that's going to be accelerating. So we're just looking at you know huge cost of life from the continued use of fossil fuels. And we've seen in Germany and elsewhere where countries take nuclear energy off the grid regardless of how much they're scaling up their renewable uh, wind and solar energy, overwhelmingly that nuclear energy is being replaced by fossil fuels. So every nuclear plant that we can get online is saving people's lives, keeping fossil fuels from being burnt, keeping that pollution out of the air. It's improving people's people's lives and and helping to extend people's lives. So I think it's absolutely essential 
that we're getting these plants coming online and and getting more clean energy on the grid. What is it like being a woman in the nuclear energy s- sector? I think it, the the stat is I believe around 20% make up currently the the workforce. It's interesting. Uh, I I think we often stick out a bit so people tend to know who we are, but we can also be overlooked, especially as an engineer. Sometimes people assume that we're we're an admin or we're some sort of support staff and, and won't necessarily come to us to ask for our expertise. So w- we really do have to make our expertise known and be very competent to, to make sure that we are um, doing our jobs well and, and representing ourselves well. It's funny going back to when I worked at the operating plant in in the U.S. and again this was uh, almost 20 years ago. And I'm I would hope that things have changed a little bit since then. But there were only there were two young women in engineering in all of engineering at the plant of 60 60 to 100 people. There were two young women, me and one other, and we were constantly called each other's names, <laughs> which is funny because there were only two of us, uh, and you would think people would be able to tell us apart. We didn't look anything alike. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, it was helpful for me. All of the operators knew who I was as a reactor engineer. I would, I would come into the control rooms almost every day to come and and check on the plant parameters and take some logs and make sure that they had what they needed in terms of core predictions and knowing what was happening with uh, with upcoming power uh, changes if any and they all knew who I was and I was able to come in and, and get my work done maybe a little bit faster than I would have been able to do if I was just you know some some faceless number of of male engineers that were at the plant. What advice do you have to women today who are um, pursuing a career in the nuclear sector, whether it's in engineering, communications? I mean, there are a lot of jobs associated, not just on the engineering side. Absolutely, and that's something that I talk to to young folks about pretty often when they are interested in, in nuclear energy. It's not just nuclear engineers that that work in in nuclear energy and and even broad more broadly in in clean energy now. The number of of nuclear engineers that you need to build a nuclear plant is actually really really small. When I worked at the operating plant, there were there were five or six nuclear engineers at a, a two unit site of fifteen hundred people, six six out of fifteen hundred people. All the other roles are so important. People that are doing electrical work or pipe fitting, operations and uh, radiological checks, all of that that other work is is so important as well. And so for for young folks or women but but for everyone really finding that that niche in that area that gets you really excited about what you can contribute that's the area that that you should look into if that's engineering that's wonderful we need we need lots of engineers too but we also need people that are excited about science but are good communicators there there are all those different areas that that we really do need the support so just find something that you are excited about and enthusiastic about and that you can be amazing at and come and bring bring those talents to us. Okay, uh, Gail Hauk, uh, Senior Advisor with the Office of Nuclear Energy, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. 